have uh, John Kelly and Mark Smith with us today. It's a pleasure to have them here. Uh, John Kelly is uh, at the Berman Center for the In Internet and Society at Harvard Law School. His research blends social network analysis, content analysis, and statistics to solve the problem of making complex online networks visible and understandable. This might be difficult to grasp for some people, including myself. <laughs> Would you give us an example as uh, the, the type of work you do with, with uh, kind, kinds of things you address with uh -huh. your research? Sure, well most of my research right now is focused on an effort to map the global blogosphere, essentially. So I look at uh, how weblogs around the world are linked to each other. And uh, this is in every language uh, coming from any country. And we study these networks uh, that are formed by all of these interconnections. Uh, and what I mean by making that uh, uh, easily understandable is that we do a lot of visualization of these networks. Uh, and then once we have this visualization, uh, we can use it to look at what bloggers are talking about, look at what they're linking to, to really explore their behavior and uh, understand what's going on better in social media. Thank you. And Mark Smith is a sociologist specializing in the social organization of online communities and computer-mediated interaction. He leads the connection, Connected Action Consulting Group and lives and works in Silicon Valley, California. So will you give us also an example of the kind of questions Connected Action addresses normally so that people can get a hold of well, thanks for having me here. Uh, I am a sociologist and my interest is very similar to John's in exploring and mapping and visualizing how people connect to each other through the internet. Many of us are now using internet social media. We're using Facebook or email, Twitter, Flickr, all of these tools they may seem very different from one another, but what they have in common is a social network. People go to these systems and connect with other people. They may connect to other things as well. What our group does is build tools, which are free and open. Uh, one in particular allows you to reach into these systems and pull data out and then draw pictures of it. We call that tool Node XL, N-O-D-E-X-L. Uh, it's free and open on the web. And our aspiration is to make tools that enhance scholarship, to improve the ability of people to understand social media, because social media is now a very important part of our society. It's where a lot of the debate, deliberation, and decision making takes place. Understanding it, mapping it, is a goal that I think many people share. Could you give us a highlight? Uh something very um, easy to see so that we, we could uh, understand it even better. So you see, you're talking about how networks are, are built. So give us an example. Sure. Well, um, when I was invited here to Segovia, I have to admit I, I knew very little about Segovia and I looked on the web about it. And one thought I had was to find out the social network around people who talk about Segovia. And so I went to our tool and I typed the word Segovia in and it went to Twitter and it pulled out all of the people who had ever mentioned Segovia. And then it found all the connections amongst them. And so several hundred people have said the word Segovia, but some of those people are in the graph at a position that makes them different from others. Some people have very few connections to other people. Some people have many connections to other people. Why does that matter? Well, position in the graph is a kind of location, and location matters. And so some people may have influence, they may have power, they may have the ability to bridge separate communities. And so when we look at that map, we immediately say, who's that? Why are they over there? And what the tool does in some ways is make you ask questions that you did not know you needed to ask before. Questions about who is talking about this topic and where are they in the network of people who talk about a topic. That can be useful. Uh, we are here at a discussion of political uh, communication. And of course, some of those topics are not just the name of a town, but maybe the name of a piece of legislation or a social issue 
political issue. And so it can be very useful to find out amongst a population of people who all mentioned the term, who is in the center of that conversation. Mm -hmm. I, I see uh, quite a, a number of perils around that. <laughs> One of it, and I think you mentioned that yesterday, or another panelist um, mentioned, was mentioning that privacy issues around that, gathering all that information. Could you elaborate a little bit on that? On the privacy issues? Well, I think Mark and I work with uh, sometimes different sources of, of uh, network data, and uh, the ones I work with are mainly web logs. And so a big privacy concern that we face is really around um, working on mapping blogs in unfree countries. So uh, places where you have repressive governments, where you have strong secret police forces. Uh, we have to be very careful in our research, which identifies particularly different kinds of political uh, uh, bloggers that we don't uh, accidentally or on purpose release information that would help uh, security forces of that government go find them. So we're very careful about that. Uh, Mark faces completely different uh, uh, well, like the blogosphere, things like Twitter, Flickr, YouTube, one could argue are very public sources of information. And so your point about privacy is a valid one. There are privacy concerns. Uh, my solution to that challenge is to avoid, for the most part, private data. Now, we could then go on and have a discussion about whether or not public data that has not been assembled is free to be assembled in a way that reveals more insight into that data. And I think that's a, a fair discussion, and we should have a discussion about what the best practices and the ethical guidelines are for the use of that data. At the moment, it's still very early in that discussion, and so my approach has been, for the most part, to focus on public available data and not private data. And so that is one possible solution. Having said that, there are many people who are using private data, uh, many organizations, perhaps governments, who are analyzing communication patterns, and they um, do not seem to have the same concerns uh, about privacy that you and I might have. Another possible da danger I was thinking about is what happens to those people who, uh, for instance, all people, people with disabilities, uh, uh, communities less, uh, you know, with less instruction, uh, they, they are put aside somehow because they are not part of the, they may not be part of the equation. So do you think uh, in the future uh, these technologies will uh, broaden the gap between uh, that inequality or on the contrary, they will get incorporated into? Well, so we, we have a name for this issue. We call it uh, the digital divide. And indeed, uh, on, there is a big disparity between access to computing resources and network resources at different class levels. That's true. Um, having said that, technology has a property of getting much cheaper. And so while mobile phones were once exclusively used by very wealthy people. We now see that mobile phones are available for five US dollars in third world countries, and that we are now about to cross about three billion mobile phones on Earth. In many ways, the mobile phone is the lowest possible on-ramp, the lowest cost possible on-ramp to the internet. And so one possible answer to the digital divide is technology will solve this problem. On the other hand, I'd have to say that access to hardware is not the only element of the digital divide. There is also literacy. And literacy is a complex process. It requires a lot of in, uh, investment in education. Education is not uniformly distributed. And as a result, even if you have the hardware, you may not know how to use it effectively. And so this form of inequality does persist. Uh, I would argue there, is, or there are many forms of inequality in different societies, and this is just another one of them. Is it politically important that we reduce that inequality? I would agree that we should invest in the education necessary to allow people to use these tools effectively to improve their social and economic situation. 
I, I just had two of the categories of people you mentioned. You mentioned people that were sick or had chronic illnesses, and you mentioned older people. Uh, there's some good news, I think, on those fronts. There's some reason for optimism. Uh, if you look in the U.S., early on with the adoption of the Internet, uh, it, was very, it, was, it was really biased towards the young. And uh, a lot of people were scared that older folks wouldn't get online, wouldn't make very uh, effective use of the medium or be locked out of it. And it's really sort of turned around. I mean, I think particularly you've got so many grandparents that want to uh, email their grandkids and kind of be in touch. And you know, my own grandparents <laughs> fall into this category. That uh, it's been a, There's been a real heavy adoption of uh, the Internet uh, uh, among older folks who can afford it, which is, you know, as it gets cheaper, um, you know, most of them. Uh, so that fear kind of turned out not to be su such a, uh, really anything to worry about. And similarly with um, chronically uh, ill uh, uh, folks, we've seen the growth of a lot of support groups, uh, particularly, you know, there are communities that can serve people. Uh, online technologies are very good for this, for uh, bringing together people that may be far flung and don't have the chance for a face-to-face -face relationship to form a relationship around some common shared experience or bond. Uh, and, you know, I, I know Mark has actually studied some of this, some mm. of the support groups that form around people with particular illnesses. So I think that th there's actually good news on that front as well. Mm. Thanks. We just have time for one more question. And uh, I would like to ask you in a nutshell, uh, what will be your recommendation for a young communicator? Mm -hmm. mm. For a young communicator in yeah. which, uh, which category, <laughs> corporations, politics, or just for anything in general? I will say yeah. a, a global young communicator yeah. with... Yeah. Hmm. Uh, well, I think the, probably the most important thing is to... Got two answers. One, uh, be very, very good in communicating in as many media as possible because the convergence of different media, the kind of decline of specialization means that you, you should be re ready to do audio, video, and written communications. So know all the different skills. But also, I think the, uh, the real, the very important thing is the, probably the oldest advice you can give to any communicator, which is have a good story. Uh, have something you want to tell, uh, tell it in a compelling way uh, that connects with people. Uh, and I don't think that technology changes that. I think that was as true a thousand years ago as it is today. Hmm. Yeah, I, well, I guess uh, following on uh, some points John made, uh, it would really depend on what nation you live in and under what kind of political regime you live in. Uh, in some cases, it might be very dangerous for you to be a communicator. And I, I would say that while it's not a positive lesson, uh, maybe you shouldn't communicate for your own safety. Among people living in more open societies, I, I would also uh, underscore your point, there are many tools. Use them. And you, you know, you, you'll have to use Flickr, Facebook, Twitter, you know, there is a list of these things. Um, do do video. Uh, do put up slides. Do put up photos. Post a blog post. The combination of these things form a whole. And you will then be discoverable. And again, uh, John makes a good point. Have something to say. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you for having us.